very much for having me here. This is exciting um, and very interesting for me um, to be part of uh, this workshop, which I've, you know, I've looked at the uh, speakers and the kind of sequence here, and I'm um, trying to get my bearings on, on sort of the trajectory of the types of issues you deal with here and contextualizing the self. But I did want to talk about drawing the sort of, <coughs> Uh, early Chinese, um, usually called Taoist thinker from the uh, 3rd century BC, or 4th and 3rd century BC maybe. Um, and contextualizing the self, um, one of the interesting things about the Zhuangzi text and some of the passages I wanted us to look at, um, uh, this is one of um, a handful of cases we can find uh, in world philosophy where um, the existence of the self is called into question. In other words, um, a, a, um, the validity of the concept of self itself um, is um, uh, challenged. Um, other examples of that are sort of obvious. I mean, sort of the, the, uh, the big one that comes to mind is, of course, the Buddhist tradition in India, it's kind of the, uh, uh, the rock star of non-self doctrines, maybe, um, as a very early example. Um, you have people who often raised in this context, David Hume in Europe, um, Nietzsche uh, questions the, the idea of the self as, a, as a, an ultimate existence. You could say that all materialist doctrines, going back to the atomists in ancient Greece, in a certain way did that, insofar as they um, claim that the self is not an ultimate existence, right? The ultimate existences are atoms of the void. Um, and the Zhuangzi case is kind of interesting in this um, array because when we talk about a denial of the self, two, two, two first questions to deal with, first of all. Um, denial of the self, I don't mean um, you know, um, a call for selflessness in the ethical sense, right? That is to say, um, unselfishness or something like that, that of course we get in a lot of different places. Um, in the Zhuangzi case, and also in the Tao Te Ching, another Taoist text, we have um, the claim that the perfect person has no self sometimes, and that sounds a little bit like the ethical version, right? Um, we have practices of something called forgetting the self or fasting of the mind or um, uh, um, losing the self, which sound like a kind of attained state. And there is definitely that dimension in the Zhuangzi presentation here. So we have something of a combination of the kind of ethical non-self and what you might call the epistemological non-self, the actual denial that there is uh, of the reality of the self, right? Is, is there, in fact, such a thing as the self? Now, when we talk about contextualizing self, or we talk about contextualizing non-self, we have to first ask what kind of self is it that's being challenged, um, right? We shouldn't assume that um, this is a kind of univocal concept across cultures, actually. There's a lot of different words for the self in a lot of different languages. Um, the Chinese case, well, let's go back to the Buddhist case. Um, in the Buddhist case, you know, when they deny Atman, um, they have a very specific thing they're denying. It's, a, it's a, an in, a metaphysically independent and unified entity. Um, also, in early Buddhist texts, something like, something which has um, unilateral control of its own behavior. So, an agent. Um, in Hume's case, you might say um, we're looking for some uh, empirical presence of the self if the criterion of reality is empirical availability and the challenge to the self um, suggests that that cannot be found. This is a phantom concept uh, which is not empirically available. Um, the other two cases I mentioned, Nietzsche and the ancient animists, interestingly, um, have, a, have a kind of funny link which I want to use as a segue into the, the bulk of this discussion. Um, Nietzsche made an interesting suggestion when he, he, um, he put forth the idea that the notion of the soul um, is a kind of atomism itself, a psychological atomism. That the independent self is sort of correlative to the atomistic idea, the idea of independently uh, existing ultimate entities that cannot be further reduced. Out in the world, atoms, in the self, something called a soul, perhaps an immortal soul. Um, but of course, he rejects both of those as errors. <coughs> um, again, this is uh, part of the picture for the ancient atomists, and they're, they're denying ultimate reality on the grounds that the self is not something uh, that is uh, indissoluble, or that is an ultimate um, existence. And I bring all this up because the kind of self that we're going to find denied in the Zhuangzi 
isn't really any of those kinds of selves, per se. One of the interesting things about early Chinese thought is it actually has no um, animistic doctrine, either for matter, for things in the world, or for selves, or for um, souls. Um, when it doesn't really even have an element theory until quite late, and when it does, it's um, not about ultimate uh, things into which things can be ultimately reduced, kind of arcade type theory, um, but a set of processes that turn into each other, the Wu Xing, the five phases. Right? Um, and the interesting thing about that is those are said to be, in a sort of later period, all qi, which is sort of vital energy. But qi does not have any smallest parts. It's not reducible to particles. It does, it's not composed of elements that build up. And this means that um, the, de the sort of deconstruction of the self it's not a deconstruction of a self that's either composed of or is itself a, an irreducible existence. And that means both the Buddhist and you might say the materialist reduction of the self, both of which are based on a kind of reductionism, are not what we should expect to find here because those are not the kinds of selves that are suggested. What we have instead, uh, I'll add one more quick thing about that. Um, another interesting thing that's lacking if we look comparatively in early Chinese thought is um, well, a creation myth in the earliest strata of uh, literate culture, so no story about the beginning of the world, and concomitantly, um, no ready-made picture of a unilateral creator, agent, controller. We have, of course, very powerful entities, we have a lot of interest in rulership, but we don't have any um, final metaphysical model of ultimate control. And so we will have a question of agency here, but um, this will be conceived in a slightly different way. And I'm, all, I'm talking here all about the kind of self that is assumed and then denied in the drawings. And it was to sort of to get you nearer to what kind of self that would be that I, um, um, I had this first passage sent around. Now I hope everybody got this, because um, unfortunately this was kind of an afterthought. So I sent you a big chunk of two chapters of the drawings, and then lastly, one little paragraph from chapter one. Does everybody have that? If not, no? no? Okay. All right. Okay, well, I'm gonna read it to you. I'll tell you the story of the first chapter of the drawings, which gets us into the question of self. I didn't, get, I didn't send that one out, I can tell you that to you quickly. You know, the drawings is this funny, um, beautifully written, kind of fabulous book with, with um, all these tales, and it develops philosophical points in a kind of uh, oblique way uh, that resists easy or, or final um, summarization. Um, and it begins with this story of a fish who is huge, uh, so huge his length cannot be known, who happens also have the name of a fish egg, the tiniest type of fish, who transforms into an enormous bird, and the bird flies up in the sky, and, uh, He's so far up in the sky that it's impossible to tell even if it's really a bird or if it's uh, just a speck of dust up in the sky. And we're given this kind of dual perspective from top and bottom. And then we have this satirical story of little birds looking up at this giant bird and saying, what's he doing up there? What a stupid thing to do to go up so high. Doesn't he know that flying, it just means jumping from one bush to another like this. What, what's the use of this kind of... Um, silly expenditure. And then the text sort of says, um, you know, for something very large to be supported, it needs a lot of air under it, it needs its particular environment in which it can flourish, implying that um, the small birds, the large birds, um, have their um, specific habitats in which they function, and that there's sort of a, uh, an endemic problem of misunderstanding between these perspectives. So we have already there three themes very quickly. One is transformation from the fish to the bird. One is actually dependence, although that's kind of hidden there. Dependence upon the environment. The organism environment sort of pairing. Uh, the context problem, you might say. Dependence upon context. In other words, why the bird high? Because um, he needs for wings that size, a particular type of context, to flourish. And thirdly, perspective and the problems of knowledge that come with perspective. The drawings of text um, tends toward a, a sort of perspectival skepticism, or even, some would say, um, maybe nihilism. Um, 
Where that belongs in the total story that drawn to is a problem of scholarship. Um, and after that discussion, all these stories, the Johnson suddenly starts to speak in its own narrative voice, and it says this, and I'll just read this. And he whose understanding, knowledge, is sufficient to fill some one post, whose deeds meet the needs of one village, or whose virtue or virtuosity pleases some one ruler, <coughs> thus winning him a country to preside over, sees himself in just the same way as these birds. Okay, so a little satirical jibe at the kind of self-importance of something, again, context-dependent, affirmed in a particular environment, or given value in a particular environment, and then unable to see values um, that pertain to other environments and other types of life. Then the text says this, even Son Ronza, a philosopher in an earlier time, would burst out laughing at such a man. If the whole world happened to praise Son Ronza, he would not be goaded onward. If the whole world condemned him, he would not be deterred. He simply made a sharp, and fixed division between the inner and the outer, and clearly discerned where true honor and disgrace resided. He did not involve himself in anxious calculations in his dealings with the world, but nonetheless, there was still a sense in which he was not really firmly planted. Now, this is a very interesting passage to me um, for this question of the self. As you'll see, we're going to lead to a precisely a statement about the self or the lack thereof. Because this is one of the places where the idea of having a, a self, um, which is freed from its dependence on context, is floated. So Rosa was a philosopher who was starting to move in that direction in a way. And note that it's specifically in terms of praise and blame, disgrace and honor. The question was, so Rosa floated this actually very novel idea that you shouldn't worry about what people think about you. You shouldn't worry about whether society affirms or denies your value, that it's all uh, something internal and that a sharp and fixed line can be drawn between the inner and the outer. And thereby he became, as it were, seemingly independent of those judgments, not um, therefore um, subject to these critiques from little birds to big birds or from one context to another, right? Free from that. But the Chuang floats that and says, yes, that was one move. And you can see what motivates that. But then he says, but there was something that was not really firmly planted. Yo-yo uh, wei shu ye. Shu is a tree, or to plant a tree. And so the Chuang acknowledges the, the desirability of that idea of independence from context, but it actually rejects it right away as something that has no foundation, that there's something um, <coughs> Uh, illusory about an independent self as something that could simply affirm its value, that value doesn't work that way. And then it floats the kind of opposite um, alternative, and that's the next passage. He said, now Lietz, another probably mythical philosophy, rode forth upon the wind, weightlessly graceful, not heading back until 15 days had passed. He did not involve himself in anxious calculations about bringing good fortune to himself either. He, in other words, he floated on the wind. He was able to ride the wind. Although this allowed him to avoid the exertions of walking, there was still something he needed to depend on. And that's when this theme of dependence becomes explicit. Yo so dai in Chinese. Um, this is a lot like the bird image who's floating on the sort of totality of the wind above the petty individual details, the kind of global context, as it were, one fixed overall universal context, and, as it were, depending on that, as if we might depend on a universal truth or a universal value. Um, that would be another way to free ourselves of this kind of um, being blown around, uh, affirmed and negated, honored and disgraced by people in these various contexts, it seems. But Johnson rejects that alternative, too. Independence on the one hand, so also. Dependence on the universal, on the other hand, because it still involves a dependence on some specific determinate thing. This is the tricky Zhuangzi move. What does he suggest as a third thing? This is where the self comes up. Um, he goes on. But suppose you were to chariot upon what is true both to heaven and to earth. Tian Di Zhu Zheng. True, as a long philological story about that. Riding atop the back and forth of the six atmospheric breaths, I have to pause on that one. 
Back and forth is a sort of pun word, pian, that means transformation, but the actual word used means dispute, debate, riding upon the debates of the six atmospheric breaths. It's also cognate with a word meaning distinctions, okay, like pian bie, or pian lun, or pian huang. The actual character in the text we have now is, is pian lun, the pian. Um, and those six breaths are wind and rain, dark and light, hot and cold. These sort of paired transformations of atmospheric conditions. Riding upon the arguing transformations of them, so that your wandering could nowhere be brought to a halt. You would then be dependent on what, says the text, question mark. It's a rhetorical question. You could translate that less contentiously to say, then what would you be dependent on, implying you wouldn't be dependent on anything. But very pointedly, the text sticks with the question. It would be dependent upon what? Different from Leeds are riding the wind, the one wind, which actually um, comes and goes in six months. It's a specific condition. Of course, this transforming is like the bird that transforms, I mean, the fish that transforms into the bird. Leeds is like the bird if he was just stuck being a bird and could not transform into other things. So rather than total independence, rather than dependence upon the universal, what we have is a kind of constantly transforming dependence on any conditions that might arise, which are conceived of as profoundly unstable, transforming, shifting back and forth. And this is where the Zhuangzi suddenly out of nowhere says, thus I say, the utmost, the utmost man has no self in my translation. No fixed identity, but in, that's me being a little bit um, <coughs> uh, contentious in my translation. It's literally uchi. So this is the first time we get such a phrase in the, uh, in the canon here in uh, Chinese literature. But I want you to know what comes after that, because this is the thrust of what I'm getting at here. The utmost man has no self. The spirit man has no merit. The sage has no name. What's interesting about this passage is self, merit, and name are suggested as three roughly, I don't want to say synonymous, but closely allied parallel terms. And this is an important clue for us for the kind of self that is being denied when Jones says no self. A self is something which has merit, which is recognized as having value, which is affirmed. This goes back to the earlier discussion about praise and blame, right? Approbation and, um, and uh, dishonor, honor and dishonor. Merit, name. In fact, name doesn't just mean your proper name. It means, as it still does in modern Chinese, something like good name or fame, OK? Has no fame. I actually translate these um, um, no fixed identity, no particular merit, and no one name, one particular name, OK? so. A relational self is presupposed, a self which is closely linked to social value and evaluation, um, to relationships with a particular social environment, with um, a making of, uh, or recognition as making a, a, a contribution, or being affirmed by some perspective. And it is this that is denied when Zhuangzi says, there is no self, but you notice that he doesn't deny it in the first way or in the second way. He denies it in this tricky way, which I want to sort of argue is a, a kind of backhanded affirmation of it. It's an affirmation of the social relatedness, but as it were, exponentially um, uh, enhanced and increased so that any context now becomes a source of affirmation and value. And that's what I take to be the thrust of the Zhuangzian argument in chapter two, which I guess you guys do have. So maybe we can look at that. I'll make it that time. Okay, yeah. um, this chapter two of the Zhuang is a very famous uh, essay in ancient Chinese literature. Uh, my translation, Equalizing Assessment of Things, Qi Lun. Starts with this story um, where right there in the, uh, um, what, fifth line there? I have lost me, Wu San Wu. There again, we have this very explicit idea of the loss of the self. But notice also the retention of the self, I and me, some kind of double um, uh, paradoxical sense of the self, which at the same time loses itself. 
And this um, consorts, I think, very well with what we said about the first passage, both an affirmation and a negation, or a reconfiguration of this idea of the self. And to explain this, we get this rather beautiful passage. What does he mean by I lost myself? Suddenly it starts to tell this seemingly irrelevant story. Great clump belches forth its breath. The story of a windstorm in a forest, right? Where wind is blowing through all these trees with their holes and knobs and knocks. And like a musical instrument, like a reed instrument or something, when the music goes through a different kind of hole, it makes a different sound. And wee, wow, ooh, all these different sounds, all these different voices. And you should note that in Chinese, the word for sound and the voice are the same. Um, saying these different things, if you like, taking these different positions, and I'm going to tip the hand a little bit here because this is usually read as uh, a metaphor, well, several levels uh, to this metaphor, but it's going to lead ultimately to a metaphor for differing philosophical positions. So one philosophical position like the wind blowing through a kind of square-shaped hole and one a long uh, cylindrical hole, they sound different. Once again, they're bien, they're arguing with each other. But there's um, something funny about that relationship which this passage is trying to get to. So after listing and, and evoking this in great detail, he, we get at the end of this story, um, okay, that's the piping of the earth. What do you mean by the piping of heaven? And so she says, this is on page two, my number system is 2.5, 2 colon 5. It gusts through all the 10,000 differences, allowing each to go its own way. But since each one selects out its own, what identity can there be for the rouser? It's a very torturous translation. It literally just says, who? The blower, it is who? Okay? The blower, who? Or the exerter, who? Okay, so if that's supposed to be an explanation of I lost me, that would seem to suggest the me is something like that blower of wind. Who? Who is it? What is the identity of that? Well, what does the wind then re uh, refer to? Well, we get a, a beautiful passage following in on this, and if you go down to, I guess, the second paragraph there on page two, joy and anger, sorrow and happiness, plans and regrets, transformations and stagnations, unguarded abandonment, deliberate posturing. First of all, notice this list of moods, this list of dispositions, all paired in these sort of opposite dyads. <laughs> And then the drawing says, music flowing out of hollows, mushrooms of billowing steam. Like those sounds in the windstorm, anger, joy. This attitude toward the world, this position, this value system, you might say, this way of looking at the world, or this stance upon the world, or this claim about the world. Just like these... Um, uh, sounds coming out of the, uh, the trees, and then he says, day and night they alternate before us, but no one knows whence they sprout. Where do they come from? That's like who is the blower, right? Where do they come from? What is the thing at the base of them? And basically, this is sort of cautioning against um, transposing the identity of anything that appears, we might want to say empirically or phenomenologically, to the source of the phenomenological, right? Um, to uh, uh, the cause, or the, um, the uh, maker, or the, uh, the, the controller of those things, right? If the question is, um, where do they come from, given this array of them, since any identity, any particular thing, ipso facto, is one of the sounds, so if we maybe transpose the metaphor and say, within the oral sphere, what is the sound of the wind? Any sound of the wind is a particular sound of the wind. All of the sounds are the sound of the wind. But there are no sounds that are sounds of the wind. The sound of the wind. <coughs> sound is sound of the wind. You might want to say speaking is sound of the wind. To make a statement is what is most windy about wind, or the one sort of shared characteristic of wind. And as this, this moves from simply talking about moods into philosophical positions, this becomes very relevant. Argument. If you move on a little further, you'll see that um, the question of self is very remains front and center here. Uh, first, he says, 
It is from all this presented ceaselessly day and night that we come to exist. Without that, there would be no me, to be sure. But then again, without me, there would be nothing selected out from it all, or nothing selecting out from it all. There's one thing, there's another thing. Which ones are put in the foreground, which ones are put in the background, which ones are um, um, prioritized. Um, some sort of correlative relationship. There's a lot of dispute about this passage. I'm not sure which way to read it, but it's clear that it wants to say something about not only is there a pairing between these transforming positions, this lower, this wind, and its particular addition also form a kind of a pair. And neither one of those seems to exist independently either. Okay? They too present sort of a riddle. I can't really reduce it to one side or the other. I don't have a self except uh, phenomenolog phenomenally manifested, and yet myself is never phenomenally manifested. I don't. I can't ever actually locate it. Um, there's, uh, of course, obviously other ways to approach that kind of a problem. We know them from the history of uh, European philosophy. Maybe we could, for example, take the road of um, thereby inferring the existence of a necessarily, necessarily empirically unavailable. Um, that's not the way the Zhuangzi goes. Um, part of that is because, um, again, of the things I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, the, um, let's say, the paradigms that were available and relevant in Chinese thought um, really didn't include that option. And so this is one of the things that's very valuable, I think, about looking at this kind of text. What would be the solutions to that similar type of impasse if we didn't have um, at our fingertips a pre-existent um, way of solving this by, as it were, upping the ante into a, a non-empirical realm. A non-empirical realm of real entities, somehow real, and so, even in some kind of attenuated way real. We don't have that. That's not an option. So um, instead, we get a continuation of this question, and this leads us in different interesting directions. Then we get a, something closer to the reductionist one, but not quite the same. He asks, um, uh, if there is some controller behind it all, it is peculiarly devoid of any manifest sign, but reality with no definite form. That's as close as we get to that non-empirical idea of a self. Right? But then he goes further. He says, the hundred bones, the nine openings, the six internal organs are all present here as my body, which is the most dear to me. It seems to me that this turn in the argument is trying to say, if you do imply that, you have to at least have something operating empirically that plays the role of that ruler, or is, if you like, the proxy or the, um, the stand-in or the operator of that. Um, and it's funny that Zhuangzi, like a lot of early Chinese thinkers, talks very concretely about the body, parts of the body. A lot of people read this passage as a rejoinder to the Confucian thinker, Mencius, who says, we have a lot of different organs and parts of the body, but we have the heart, which is here, and that is the, 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 the seat of thought and plays the role of the ruler, and every part has a legitimate claim to exist and to function, but this one should be given preeminence. This is where we have our moral intuitions, we have you know, wisdom there, we have uh, ethical feelings there, and so on, and these should be what controls the rest. A one-way hierarchy, sort of modeled on a political hierarchy, of, of parts of the body. One of the parts has the has the, the function of thinking right? and moral feelings. Um, and Zhuangzi starts to ask, which one is closest to me? Do you delight it all equally, or do you have some favorite among them? Are they mere servants and concubines? Are they servant? Are these servants and concubines unable to govern one another? Again, only questions. He doesn't give an answer, but he clearly wants to problematize the idea of a unilateral controller among the parts, either temporal parts, if I can say that, like one mood over another. Sometimes I want to be morally good. Sometimes I don't. Should one of those control the other one all the time, as Mencius thinks? Sometimes my heart's in control. Sometimes I have an itch, and maybe this part's in control for a second, something like that, OK? Do they need some third thing that's always in control, or are they shifting? Is there something sufficient among them to do that? Raises that question. Do they take turns as master and servants? If there is a genuine ruler, 
by definition, he can't show himself, or he never shows himself as ruling. So, you can read that argument a lot of ways. It might be an appeal to an empirical argument. I think it's a little more than that. But you see the general gist here in problematizing a unilateral controlling self, a ruling self. Speech is something of which it speaks. Something that it speaks of. A reference. And then an answer to that. Yes, but what it refers to is peculiarly unfixed. This is a, a special Chuangzian phrase. Really only, as far as I know, maybe Dali will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this phrase only appears in the drawings of here and in chapter 6. This to we think, okay? Peculiarly not yet fixed. Something it refers to. And I, I will um, refer you to page 11 here, where the phrase is used uh, about knowledge. You can see that what words refer to and knowledge, these are parallel, maybe identical questions. So in chapter 6 there on page 11, our understanding can be in the right, can down literally, can match, can hit the mark, only by virtual relation of dependence. Il so That is to say, it depends on something in order to be right. And what it depends on is always peculiarly unfixed. What it depends on, what knowledge depends on, the standard of knowledge, not only the standard of knowledge, the standard, I think Johnson wants to argue, of reference. And this is when we get right back to the question of the self. Um, so, and this is the last bit I'll do, I think, because this is running way longer. Than So he goes on. First of all, I want you to know. So is there really anything it refers to? Or has nothing ever been referred to? Please note as you read through the drones how many times you get these two questions which don't resolve. Right? And so he's not saying it doesn't refer to anything because what it refers to is peculiarly unfixed. And he's not saying it does. He's saying, so does it? And the blower is whom? And you would depend on what? Okay? Simply that it no longer becomes a simple uh, bivalent question in the way it might have been assumed to be before that. Um, he says, you take it, your speech, your reference in words, to be different from the chirping of baby birds. But is there really any difference, or is there no difference? I'm not saying there's no difference, mind you. But I'm asking you, is there really ultimately any difference or not? Any pian? That's that same word riding on the back and forth of the six breaths. Any dispute, therefore, between them or not. I'm not saying there's no dispute between your words and mine, your chirpings and mine, that wind sound and mine, and I'm not saying there are. Um, I'm asking you, and why? Why does he say what it refers to as the helium fix? This is the, the heart of the matter. Um, so I'm going to read through the next three paragraphs in detail. This will be the heart of our, our reading part of this, if that's okay, okay? How can courses, that's the word Tao, how can courses be so obscure that there could be any question of genuine or fake among them? Course, Tao, with the way, probably you have seen it translated. You know, Chinese um, does not have plural or singular, right? It doesn't have past or present, doesn't have gender, doesn't have cases, doesn't have declensions. Um, doesn't have tenses. So um, when we see that word Tao, it's up to us through context and through the coherence of the reading we can produce to determine is it um, courses, the course, some courses, a course. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have articles either, definite or indefinite, right? It doesn't have capitalization. It also doesn't have punctuation. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of leeway here. And the, the great determinant in that chaos, you might say, is parallelism and, well, context. So here, this reading suggests, um, this is a much longer, maybe we can have this discussion in the later part today, um, uh, the evolution of the term Tao from what we would normally translate with a small d, uh, meaning a road or a way, or maybe a method, a way of doing something, to this sort of grandiose, seemingly metaphysical, the Tao concept. Okay? And I believe that here, we are, we are using this term in its older, 
a more basic sense of just courses, paths, ways. Now that's not just physical paths. Actually, the, the sort of primary use of the term early on had to do with way, just like you nowadays, you know, you know what like judo is, right? Judo, the do in judo is dao, the way of gentleness, okay? Or chago in Japanese, right? Which is the way of tea. Or kendo, which is the way of swordsmanship, right? They're a course, that's why I use course here, a way of practice in order to attain a valued goal. Okay, so a set of practices usually, and then the way of benevolence and righteousness, or the way of the former kings, or the way of good government, or the way of heaven. Heaven does stuff too, it turns around in a circle, and it makes rain fall down, and things like that. Okay, so um, these things do things, and um, you can emulate their ways, or you can learn their ways, or you can practice their ways, and when you do that, you attain something like a duh virtuosity thereby. So how can courses be so obscure that there would be any question of genuine fake among them? Which is the real Tao, that question? How can words be so obscure that there would be any question of right or wrong among them? Note that Tao's and words are parallel here. So Tao's are ways of practicing, and words are ways of instructing how to practice, how to do things. Setting of values, setting of terms, giving of definitions, giving uh, descriptions, sometimes loaded descriptions, of desiderata um, in order to attain certain ends. You might say there's a deep pragmatic base, basis here in the uh, sort of you know, prejudice in the, uh, uh, built into the words here. Duangsa says, where can you go without it being a course? Where can you go without it being a way? How can you walk anywhere without it being Away. Walking, as he says a little later, we won't get to it, is paths are made by walking them. Okay? But the much more radical implication of that, given how this is set up, what can you say without it being affirmable? What can you say without it being sayable? What can you say without it being said? I think that's in uh, all you need is love, isn't it? Um, so these two are looked at as precisely parallel in structure. Okay? Something is affirmed, just like somewhere is gone to, and in, so, in going somewhere, or in affirming something, you have demonstrated, performatively, if you like, the sayability, the affirmability, the Tao-ability of that deed or that word. Why does he say that? <coughs> then, this is a little off our current topic, but courses are obscured by small accomplishments already formed and completed by them. So the idea is every, everywhere you go, you accomplish something. Everywhere you go is a way. Everywhere a, a, arrives somewhere. But a second course is obscured by a small accomplishment. In other words, what was accomplished by part of the way or by some other way or by, by more way. So what gets in the way of the way? The way. Right? What gets in the way of the sounds coming out of the, uh, the blowing of the wind is also the blowing of the wind, if you like. Right? And there's no one sound that is the blowing of the wind. Where could there be a sound which is not the sound of the wind, you might say? Um, similarly, words are obscured by the ostentatious blossoms of reputation. And that's the same as name in the first passage in chapter 1. Reputation, name, socially recognized identity or merit. Um, now, analogized to the small completions on the path. Hence, we have the rights and wrongs of the Confucians and the Moists, each affirming what the other negates and negating what the other affirms. So here's where we get explicitly into philosophical disputes, right? The Confucians say, yes, sure, in Chinese, to filial piety, let's say. The Moists say, no, it's wrong, filial piety should have universal will love for all, um, and vice versa, okay? And this is why, you know, in spite of both of them being paths or vows, they have these mutual negations of them. And then Zhuang Tzu gets very clever, and he says, so they each want to affirm what the other negates and what negate what the other affirms, and we can do that. We can accomplish just what they want to do. If you want to do that, nothing compares to the illumination, my translation, illumination of the obvious, he means. It's very easy to affirm what they negate and negate what they affirm. We're going to go by the one most obvious thing that it's possible to say. And I take it that is what he gives us in the next two paragraphs, although it will seem wildly counterintuitive. 
here's what he says. There is no thing that is not that. There is no thing that is not this. Ralph is here using two terms. I guess it's a question to answer. He will say this and that. He will also say this and that. And a lot of this, you might say, um, depends on kind of a pun on this term. Sure. So I'm going to keep saying sure, fe, sure, fe, sure, fe. Sure means this, but it also means right. Or approve of something as right. Okay? And when its antonym, antonym is be, this just means other or that. Whereas this means not. That's not it or something like that. Use the AC gram. But sure, fe, together, wrong, or disapprove. So you see here we get back to this question about identities and values that came up at the very beginning, right? When he says nothing is not this, nothing is not that, he's making a, you know, a beyond trivial point, right? This is just a point linguists would say is about indexicals, right? The kinds of words that mean something different depending on what you're pointing to, right? So this is a bottle, this is a cup. So is this a cup? Everything is this. That's this, this, this. Everything is that, okay? If I say that's this, then now that's that, right? The thing of it is, though, Chongzi will go on to suggest, I guess I want to say, a lot of words like this, and they stand at the very basis of what our words refer to, our ways of dividing up the world, assigning names, the thing that's supposed to distinguish speech from the chirping of baby birds or the blowing of wind, that it has some fixed reference point. But the baseline reference points are things like this, that, now, then, work the same way, right? It's always now, it's always then. And of course, self, other, me, you, those sorts of terms. Also indexical. Their uh, reference changes depending on who is speaking them when and what they're looking at or pointing to or doing. When they do it. Um, as I say, the obvious, you might say the trivial, the elimination of the trivial, in our translation. Um, <clears throat> but one cannot be seeing these from the perspective of that. One knows them only from this. That is to say, now this line is very controversial, in other ways to translate it, but I take the argument here to go a little bit beyond that to say that um, it's not just that I can at will, at my whimsy, point in a different direction. It's that, of course, when I do say this, my this only has meaning in distinction to the that that it excludes, right? So when I posit a this, I'm simultaneously positing a that. But positing a that, the weird thing about this is that it includes this affirmation, this kind of self-affirmation. So as soon as I make room for or allow the existence of an alternate perspective, as soon as I take a perspective, I've allowed the existence of other perspectives. For this to be a perspective is for me to already be contrasting it to other possible perspectives. But if I've done that, I've opened a virtual space where standing in that perspective, I am the that, right? So just by being this, I am being that. It's not that someone, a third party, has to go and point to the two and say this, that, this, that. It's making something this makes it that, right? If there's one point in space, given the nature of space, and given the nature of a point, I've admitted other points in space. And if there are other points in space, this first point in space is other to those points in space, right? So I've made it the referent and it's, I've made it the self and the other at the same time, if you like. Now and then. If I acknowledge a point in time, I've acknowledged other points in time, right? If I acknowledge a now, I've acknowledged that this now is also then. And so he goes on. That emerges from this and this follows from that. The simultaneous generation of this is By the same token, and now he goes meta on us. 
their simultaneous generation is their simultaneous destruction. That is, I think maybe we take that in two senses. Um, one, that we can simply say generation is contrasted to what? Destruction. If generation is the this, destruction is the that. But the destruction is now the generation of this thing called destruction. And that now becomes the thing that defines what is being generated, what is the standard by which we're judging whether, some, whether something succeeds in being the coming into existence that we are as we're looking for. I think I use a metaphor, I gave you a little, um, uh, a link to something online, and, and maybe this will help. I mean, because there's, a, there's an implication here that <clears throat> having a perspective or positing the existence of something, as it were, gives it a voice. And when one of those voices speaks, it necessarily negates the other speech. So I have a little parable in there, right? It's as if you have this sort of booth at a carnival or something, and there's a, a fi human figure standing in there, and he says, you know, I'm the real one. And you what? He goes, yeah, you know, right in back of me, there's another one who looks just like me, but he's a fake, he's a robot, he's an android. It's very easy to tell if you compare us, okay? I'm the real one. And then he's, as it were, invited or even, um, require you to go walk around to the other side of this booth where you can no longer see or hear him, right? Now all you hear is the other guy, the other guy says, I'm the real one. It's very easy to tell if you compare, right? The, you only hear the one which is being brought to light, as it were, the illumination of the obvious, the living is being brought to light. When something is brought to light, uh, where it is, what it is doing, where can it go that is not a path, if you like, or a way. What can it say that is not affirmable? So in saying this, in being there, it is simultaneously positing itself, as it were, as the standard of what counts as this, as right. Okay. Should I uh, wrap up? Um, okay. Where does this lead? Okay. okay. So uh, one more paragraph, okay? You must look at this. Um, he sums this up by saying, um, going by the rightness of the present this, in sure, okay? Following the sure, the rightness of the present this, and finally, uh, hmm, where did I get there? Walking two roads at once, which comes a little bit further on here. Not merely going along with the, um, the present one, but because the this is also always, insofar as a, as a this, is also a that, or also a wrong, um, involves itself also in an acknowledgement of the, let's say, transcendability of any of those points of view. So I would say the heart of the, of the argument well, comes here in the middle paragraph on four. He says, this is also a that, that is also a this. That posits a this and a that, a right and a wrong of its own, but this also posits a this and a that, a right and a wrong of its own. That is to say, this is also really this, that, which is contrasted to that, but that is also that, this. You see what I mean, right? Because to be this is to be that, and this has its own system of right and wrong, which includes that and includes the perspective that negates itself, um, and vice versa. And then he gives you one of these questions again. He says, so is there really any that versus this, any right versus wrong? He doesn't say there is not, again, right? He doesn't want to say, look, this proves there isn't any. He says, is there a distinction between them or not? Because in one sense, there's always a distinction. In fact, you can't, however finally you split the magnet, if you like, you always end up with two poems, right? You never reduce this to one sort of undifferentiated pure rightness. As long as there's thisness, there's thatness, but you can keep slicing, right? And you get a this, that here, and this, that here, and this, that here. All right? So you could say there really is a distinction between this and that. In fact, it's a much more profound distinction between this and that, right and wrong, than you originally thought, because it's absolutely ineradicable from any conceivable um, positive thing. But on the other hand, if we say there's a contrast between this and that, the contrast is supposed to imply that what's on the two sides of the contrast is different. But structurally, at least, what's on the two sides ends up being the same content on the two sides, right? This, that, 
contrasted to this, that, or the contrast contrasted to the contrast, something like that. And again, that doesn't resolve either into saying, okay, so there's no time, right? right? He wants to say, is there, isn't there? And finally, I can end here, okay? Um, when this and that, right and wrong, are no longer coupled as opposites, that is to say, when they don't, that is not, again, to say that they're resolved into one or that they're absolutely distinct. It's to say, when this question, are they or aren't they distinct, given this structural, this sort of unavoidable structure to them, um, what do you have then? they no longer stably become a pair of opposites. And this actually echoes a phrase in that windstorm story where he says, I lost me, and he's described as if he had lost his partner. It's actually a slight play on the actual character, okay? Um, loosed from a partner, I think I translated there, right? The corresponding other that defines him. It's not that it's completely gone, it's that they no longer find a fixed, um, as it were, stable, um, corresponding opposites. This is called the course as axis, one of the axes of all courses. I'm just double translating the same phrase. When this axis finds its place in the center, it responds to all endless things it confronts, thwarted by none, for it has an endless supply of rights and an endless supply of wrong. That is to say, it doesn't get rid of the distinction between right and wrong. And on the contrary, it multiplies the distinctions between right and wrong, you might say. It's just that they're no longer a single univocal system of right and wrong. So you could say you end up with more, or you could say you end up with less. Right? And that's, I think, exactly where Joel's going to go. Now, how that plays out, how we like address you know, pragmatically various types of problems that come up, and how we resolve everything else, I'm going to leave all that to God. <laughs> before you leave, yeah. before you leave just, just remember a very brief summary. I mean. Remember that most of the people around here are historians and are not sort of in well versed in this, this this type of language. So tell us what does it mean culturally and socially to be a Taoist? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have five minutes. <laughs> what does it mean? Does it make me a relativist? Does it make me okay? Okay. So yeah, good. Let's sort of big picture step back. Okay. First thing. First thing is. Taoist what is a very misleading term, so just have a cultural historical uh, level. Um, we talk about these texts, the Tao Te Ching and the Zhuangzi, we, if you look in a, an encyclopedia or something, we'll say these Taoist philosophers. They didn't think of themselves as Taoist philosophers. There was, as far as we know, no school, formal school. Uh, it wasn't until far after the fact that people started putting this label on them, okay? Taoists. Now, there's also a thing called the Taoist religion, many things actually called the Taoist religion, and which are uh, different term is used in Chinese. So when you go to a Taoist temple... Let me, let me focus on it. Yeah. What does it mean to hold the views that you have just been All right. All right. Okay. Um, well, it is actually still part of the relevant question. Okay, so we would have to say um, the book Zhuangzi includes this section, and then it includes what I and, and many scholars regard as sort of an accretion of further elaborations on these sorts of ideas. They take this, you might say, I think it's sometimes called radical drawings of tradition, differently. So you end up with sort of a compendium of different approaches. I'll give you an example of some of them. Some of them look at the relativism as a kind of therapeutic step that leads to the dissolution of a particular kind of knowledge, opening the way right, for, for some other kind of knowledge, but a knowledge which although it may not be expressible uh, propositionally, uh, nonetheless has sort of a guiding function and has some kind of a determinate role. <coughs> and there are different versions of that, of course, right? Um, there are people, I would say Guo Xiang, the commentator who wrote on this, who take the, I would say, the radical Zhuangzi position, uh, but he takes it in a way which he wants to make more friendly to participation in existing social structures and sort of a reproach them all with, with Confucianism. And the reason he's able to do that, of course, is to say, hey, any way is right, including this way, right? So should, should you obey conventions? In his view, yes. yes. You should obey conventions. However, you should not obey conventions as if uh, in, in the belief that they have any special right. So it's not right. truth, yeah. but you still should obey. Not necessarily you should, but it's an option for you to 
Okay. There's nothing wrong with obeying. There's nothing wrong with you obeying if you find yourself so you're in Israel doing. Um, but but the, on the other hand, it, you might want to vote, right? He, and that's when, you know, his way of looking at it, it no longer provides concrete guidance, it provides a kind of meta-level um, modality of regarding the way, uh, 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 rethinking what action is. Yes. I think we have a lot of questions, but before, before that, thank you, Brooke. Uh, we want to... Professor Gallia Pachomir, a friend and a colleague, is uh, uh, the chair of the Department of East Asian Studies. She focuses on Chinese philosophy and comparative philosophy uh, in the Departments of East Asian Studies and Philosophy. She, uh, her research focuses primarily on uh, neo-Confucian uh, philosophy, on Confucian humanism, dialogue and self-realization, the philosophy of death, and the living riddles in culture. Recent project focuses on Confucian theory and uh, practice in the contemporary world. She wrote a book on human nature and Chinese philosophies and religion uh, and religions. And her book, uh, To Broaden the Way, a Confucian Jewish Dialogue, focuses on the theme of ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, community and individual pursuit is dealt with in both traditions through religious text, philosophical methodologies, and literary sources. Her book, or most recent, uh, Tong Shu Text and Commentary, uh, Way in the Way a Person, came out in Hebrew this, this last summer, and she published articles Taoism, Confucianism, and Neo Confucianism. Uh, yeah, please. Okay, so I'll try to take um, a complex question <laughs> and uh, maybe make it a little more complex the self and the junk. Uh, and I think that sometimes uh, making it more complex brings up uh, also the simplicity, because I think that there is some simplicity in the Zhuangzhen uh, idea of the self. And what I want to do here is basically take a, a, a different take, my take, on the self <coughs> as transformation, dependence, and uh, perspectives, uh, you know, um, so yeah, yes, so uh, it's transforming, it, it is never fixed, as uh, depending, it is never free, and as ha having its own perspective, uh, or changing perspectives, uh, it can never be true. And I, I want to start with this conflictual language with, with, with which the, the self is referred to uh, as, as a starting point to uh, what I say here. I hope it will make some sense. So I, I would like to relate uh, Zhuangzi's paradoxical presentation of self with what the philosopher of social science, Peter Winch, calls a sense of the significance of human life. In his article, Winch refers to Rush Reese's point on Wittgenstein's language game as played by men who have lived life to live. Winch su suggests finding limits of major notions for arriving and those limits may show us the space of discourse in the particular culture, even if we are not part of it. These notions give shape to what we understand by human life. The limit we speak of is not only the point at which our rationality reaches an end, it is the point toward which we extend our specific notions and sometimes as a consequence of our experience too. It is also the point where we extend our whole framework of rationality, where we sometimes suspend it. I would like to suggest a Zhuangzian case of this kind of extension, and as we see it in his idea of the self, uh, following Brooks' uh, suggestion, and I, I will read from 
Brooks. No, no one said it before, so I have to say that it is the most beautiful translation for the drunks. I know that many of you have read the translations for drunks, uh, and we have tens, if not how many translations. Uh, but but, but I, even I, I must tell you that before I knew Brooke, <laughs> I, uh, when I saw this uh, translation, I felt that it both uh, captures the spirit of the text that, as you know, is not uh, an easy achievement and brings, and it's never on the expense of the depth of the philosophical ideas of the drunk. Because sometimes a text either more brings the spirit or goes in the, the philosophical ideas and this one is, is a wonderful combination. So, so I, I read uh, a few passages from uh, Brooke's translation that I truly recommend. Uh, I had to say. Um, so here is an example uh, from the sixth chapter uh, that we read in advance and Brooke referred to. Yang Hui said, I am making a progress. Confucius said, what do you mean? Yahweh said, I have forgotten humanity and responsibility. Confucius said, that's good, but you are still not there. Another day, he came again and said, I am making progress. What do you mean? I have forgotten ritual and music. Confucius said, that's good, but you're still not there. He returned another day and said yet again, I am making progress. What do you mean? Yan Hui said, I just sit and forget. Confuci Confucius jolted as if kicked, said, what do you mean you sit and forget? Yan Hui said, it's a dropping away of my limbs and torso, a chasing off of my sensory equity, with, which disperses my physical form and ousts my understanding until I am the same as the transforming openness. Quite an interesting translation there for uh, that song, uh, but we, we can speak about it later. I, I like it. Uh, this is what I call just sitting and forgetting. Confucius said, the same as it, but then you are free of all preferences. Transforming, but then you are free of all constancy. You truly are a worthy man. I beg to, ac to be accepted as your disciple. So in the passage, forgetting humanity and rightness or responsibility in the translation, then ritual and music leads to just sit and forget. Just sit and forget everything includes dissolving the connection with one's body discarding sensory perception, and dispersing knowledge and form to the point that one is the same as transformation. And John says, borrowing of the historical figures of Confucius and his loyal disciple, uh, Yan Hui, uh, some of you know that the figures in this story are uh, true figures, but the fiction uh, likely in uh, the story likely just fiction. Uh, so the fictional meeting for, for the, is for the purpose of teaching how to disconnect from the self. So Zhuangzi wants to teach us how to disconnect of the self by using Confucius and his beloved disciple Yan Hui, who would never wish to disconnect from themselves. <laughs> uh, but he does it in, in, in a frame of reference that also reaffirms the Confucian attitude regarding how social and moral skills constitute the essentials of who one is. What I mean that they all agree that ritual and humanity 
they do constitute who we are, these, these frameworks. Both Confucius know it and Zhuang does. They just only disagree of, about their importance. Um, so a riddle comes to mind when one asks how Hui can make a progress that amounts to forgetting every characteristic of who Hui is. What is the meaning of forgetting oneself? How can it be attained and in what sense is it desired? <laughs> For Zhuang, the first step is forgetting morality and the loss of complete dependence on others and of obligations to them. It allows one to freely act in a way that may match what we consider moral. Like you said earlier in, in your response to Aviad, not because she is obliged to, but because she is just so. This is Joan the that he, he, you, you can act in a way that we consider morally too, but not out of morality. Next, forgetting ritual is losing the social framework as well as one's exclusive perspective, like in the case in Analect, uh, where Confucius is asked what is humanity, and answers do not look, listen, speak, or act if not according to ritual. Okay, so again, there is a very a play that is very familiar with a knowledge of uh, Confucian analects and, and the Confucian uh, doctrine. What one is left with is the transformation of nature and its endless perspectives. When Zhuang says, Yen Hui says, I am the same as that Tong, he revisits as the open, transform open transformation of, uh, of the, or the transformation of openness. And he revisits Lao Tzu saying in chapter 23 that following the way is being the same as the way. Okay? Or, and then Guo Xiang, uh, who says that following transformation is being the same as transformation, okay? So the person who follows the way is one of the, with the way, the one who follows transformation. The, 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 there are different ways to express the very same idea. Joanne suggests a new conceptualization of self as transforming openness, that of. The self as we tend to know it appears to be a flawed reference to something that might be useful in the sense that the superstition is useful, okay? Just like when I see a black cat and I know this is going to be a horrible day. Uh, it is useful in a way uh, for me, but it, it is not uh, true in any sense. And, and this is the um, status of the self. Um, According to my understanding, Joanne brings us to think of oneself as a riddle of a special kind that cannot be responded by simple theoretical means. Rather, it's, it is responded in life itself. Let me make a short digression back to the post-Wittgensteinian line that I mentioned above briefly, especially to Cora Diamond's idea of a great riddle distinguished from regular riddles as the question of life and death in space and time. In general, okay, so it's a little digression, a riddle is distinguished from a problem or a tension since it inherently embodies a resolution. A riddle is given to a person without a method of solution. When the solution is found, one is forced to accept it, and the whole picture then gains meaningfulness. Moreover, the riddle itself should be taken as a tip or a clue to its solution. If one succeeds in following the clues of a great riddle, one gets closer to understanding life. The important advantage of a riddle is that once determined that it is a riddle, our language game automatically changes. Then, we no longer seek an answer, but point to the riddle. Often, the solution we are looking for is not the one we find. 
what we are looking for we do not know, and what we find at the end to be the solution is not what we were looking for in the first place. Diamond explains the function of riddles in philosophical discourse. She says, we express and do not express a thing, see and do not see a thing, when we express it in riddles, which is how we express it when we are unable or unwilling to put it into straight plain words appropriate to it. Such expressing and not expressing, seeing and not seeing, characterizes the attempt to talk about God. We cannot properly speaking uh, and, describe, uh, and or describe God, but we cannot properly speaking of, on describing God, but when we reason about God as it were in riddles, then what we say is not therefore false. Similarly to reasoning about God in riddles, Joan Zay uses riddle-like speech to say something about Tao, which we all know from the opening, as we know it from the opening sentence in the Tao De Jing, eh, the Tao that can be Tao, spoken, or, or whatever you want, you know, whichever way you want to translate it, is not a constant Tao. In particular, when the self is presented as Tao transformation or the transforming openness, okay, this Datong or Platon, then the self, concrete, limited, and well distinguished, is revealed a no self. In this way, the self or Zhuangzi is revealed as the riddle to be and not to be a self at once. Diamond claims that the solution to the great riddle is in the language used for the riddle. She says riddles are formed on an already familiar linguistic <coughs> pattern. We know how to deal with it, but in order to solve the riddle, what we need is not something of which we have been given a description, but something which will strike us as right to call by the phrase. Now, the solution to a riddle is independent on what exists or the no, does not exist. And it is not, and is not a way by which we can identify things falling in one concept or another. The predicate in the riddle is not a description of things. Therefore, the solution does not give any characteristics of some concept. From the conceptual perspective, the solution is a new understanding of a received idea. My expansion of this view is that a great reader is a reader we live, or a living reader. Hence, from the practical perspective, the response is found not only in the uniqueness of language, but first and foremost in practice in a specific form of life and is attained in life itself. Let us move on to a more explicit use, explicit use of the riddle by Zhuang Zhe. When earlier in chapter six, we read about the conversation of friends that I think they're perfectly, it is a perfect uh, exemplification of this relational self that in one sense is not a self, and in another, I cannot think of a stronger self. Um, so, so this is the story of uh, Zhe Ji, Zhe Yu, Zhe Li, and Zhe Lai, who were talking, and one of them, when one of them said, who can see nothingness as his own head, life as his own spine, and death as his own behind. Who knows the single body formed by life and death, existence and non-existence? I will be his friend. The four looked at one another and laughed, feeling complete concord and became friends. Now if we stay on the linguistic level, we may think of the, Ju the Juanze riddle refers solemnly to the human body. But on a second level, the fact that the four friends look at each other and laugh 
show that they have the answer. They have experienced the unity and the transformation of all things. They leave the reader. If the unity of all things is the solution to this riddle of self, we now have to understand the bodily terms quite differently. We may see the body as analogous to life or to our world, as all things exist as one body or as one world. The self is now revealed as an embodiment of life. Again, before following the story passage by passage, let us bri briefly, very briefly, digress to Zhuangzi's use of terms in this context. Because among the many terms he uses for body, and, and th there are <coughs> truly many of them, uh, in this case, he refers to body in the term T, uh, that is unique. If, for example, Xing literally means shape, form, pattern, design, and manifest outward appearance, uh, in 98 appearances in the whole text, and Shen, for example, literally means the body as the self in person, or I, myself, appearing 78 times, we encounter 29 appearances of <coughs> Uh, literally meaning the body or the substance or essence of something. The thing itself distinct from its function but also original nature as well as the verb to embody. Okay, so we have many bodies and this passage speaks about the T body uh, with perspectives of all other types of bodies. So back to our joint the living reader, the term body implies the meaning of a body without borders, both the T body, both physical and conceptual. The T body does not have discrete boundaries, but is a complex organic corpus with infinite boundaries that may be divided into many smaller increments each of which is entirely analogous to the whole and is consubstantial or con-something. It's not even substantial, it's, it's con-processual I, I, with it. The part is then equivalent to the whole, just as it is in the reader before us. A single human T-body is part of a much larger corpus Although a human being appears to have a discrete physical form, the human body is organically consubstantial with bodies of ancestors and descendants, with the bodies of all people with whom it engages and exchanges labor and food, mutually embodied in an infinite range of progressions and overlaps. To participate in this range of progressions is to be embodied with it, within it, Hence, according to my understanding, T functions here in the verbal sense of to embody. Accordingly, the self implies a larger wholeness. Joan the place with the body and inverts it conceptually, displaying what should not be looked upon, making the hidden transparent and the transforming and transforming the fragments into a wholeness such that the human body is encompassed within a larger common body that is a wholeness including life and death, heaven and earth, and all under heaven. As T, we are complete or interconnected with the larger universe. The four friends, by their being friends, are in this way one body. The friendship is one body, T, or a common body. That encompasses all things. Juanze offers the hope that people with the, with the ability to see through the discrete boundaries of form and participate in the common T body of the universe will have access to limitless freedom. Realizing that true friendship is a case for the ability to see through boundaries, or in fact, friendship 
transcends one's boundaries and reaches others as part of who we are is indeed a source for hope. As we are all familiar with friendship as attainable to all, true friendship is a perfect step in understanding life. Referring to the riddle in this way, what is given is not a mere description of the human body or of the self, and the solution will not be a certain concept of the body, but rather we may find a clue to the solution by the author's use of the characters E.T. or T. Friendship is one body or same body. Opposed to the search after objects that give us descriptions or distinctions between attributes of given objects, we must seek after actions that will turn the words into description. We are requested to change apprehension and not seek after objects, but rather seek life itself. The unity of all things can stand as a solution as it does in the Zhuangzi, just as the laughter of the four friends expresses their understanding of life and death. The riddle itself stimulates us to change our perception of things. We must need to think of a different way of thinking rather than thinking of objects through our ordinary way of perception. We must not think of the self in the ordinary way through which we are we perceive the body. But we must consider how we may think of it in different ways. In this case, how we may see life as one body. The riddle seems like a description that is not defined in, la in language. A concrete existence of something is not requested for the solution that may as well be a something that does not exist, where the range of the physical is in inconsistent with our prior concepts of physical space. The meaning of this is not denying the existence of reality, but quite oppositely. The riddle of life enables us to understand reality in a manner that we could have never imagined. Even though the riddle is formulated by words and linguistic <coughs> patterns used in China at the time of the composition of the text, for us to solve the riddle, we must step out of those linguistic patterns and find the thing, probably an action, that will strike us as the correct solution found not in language itself, but in our practice. The riddle makes us think of the body in new terms such as nothingness, life, and death, and therefore not see only a completely different model, but also some explanation of the constant transformation of things. Okay? Diamond exemplifies it with the Sphinx riddle, in the morning on four, in, uh, at noon on two, and then uh, in the evening on three, uh, which stands for uh, childhood, then uh, youth, and then uh, old age, uh, and demands of us to see, and, and the, the riddle makes, in order to understand the riddle, we have to see uh, the day as life. This is not trivia, but as soon as we understood the analogy, the riddle is uh, very clear. Uh, and uh, so we need to first look at the human being in a different manner than we normally do, and uh, not through the facts of human locomotion. Second, we need to look at the day as life. Doing so changes our perception of time and brings us to reaching and understanding that time is living and life is the person. I'm almost there. Nothingness is the head of life as the spine, of death as the rump. Is not 
look at nothing that's as the, as the head of life as the spine of that is the rump in the reader. It's not a statement trying to claim something about the human body that exists through the facts we know, but rather something that the author of the text has written in order for us to gain a different understanding of the self as an embodiment. And therefore, in our ordinary terms, a non-self. When the four friends look at each other and laugh, uh, we understand that they know the solution and therefore know how to deal with the riddle and that they know the solution is not a physiological description of the body, but that the riddle is about the unity of all things. The solution goes beyond language that manifests in life itself. It is the gaze, the laughter, as the expression of their understanding and the disappearance of boundaries. It is friendship. Not only the four know the solution to the riddle, but they practice it. Understanding Joanne's self as, a, a, as consisting a great riddle promotes our understanding of the text as a whole. If we were to take the words in an unliteral manner, and look beyond the, the words towards life, and, and beyond the words and towards life, the whole text might be understood in a different, clearer light. The words themselves may be hazy or unclear, but life, la like laughter, is not. While expressing something through a reader, we simultaneously express it and not express it, and this way of expressing becomes the best way when we cannot express something directly and analytically in mere words. And this happens when we want to say something meaningful, like uh, about happiness, about pain, about life, or death. So let us take a further look at the response to the riddle with friendship or being one body that is in fact life, time, or transformation. Suddenly, Zeyu, and I read from the text, took ill. The G went to see him. Zeyu said, how great is the creator of things, making me all tangled up like this. For his chin was stuck in his navel, his shoulders towered over the crown of his head, his ponytail pointed toward the sky, his five internal organs at the top of him, his thigh bones taking the place of his ribs, and his yin and yang energies in chaos. But his mind was relaxed and unbothered. He huddled over to the well to, the well to get a look at his reflection. Wow, he said, the creator of things has really gone and tangled me up. Zeji said, do you dislike it? Zeyo, the sick friend, said, not at all. What is there to dislike? Perhaps he will transform my left arm into a rooster. Thereby, I'll be announcing the dawn. Perhaps he will transform my right arm into a crossbow pellet. Thereby, I'll be seeking an owl to roast. Perhaps he will transform my ass into wheels and my spirit into a horse. I'll be riding along. Will I need any other vehicle? So shortly after the bond of friendship is introduced and endorsed through the reader, say you unexpectedly falls ill and his friend say, or the G, decides to go visit him. We are presented here with a con conversation in which Zeyu is undergoing corporeal transformation and is completely mutilated, while Zese com com <coughs> complete, contemplates the scene. Zeyu, the person dying, seems to ridicule and mock the conventional prejudices about death. The unavoidable and ongoing succession of transformations that mark the process inherently 
occurring in the existence of every living being has now come to bear on the you, deforming and mutilating his body in the process. In its external manifestation and the internal disharmony of its vital organs, his body becomes violently deformed and fatally sick. The normal harmonious combination of yin yang that regulates the functioning of the organism and adjusts its internal dynamics along with its interaction with the external world is in complete distortion in the case of Zeyo illness. Yet, being a Taoist sage, despite the terrible illness of his body, he remains calm. When next the lie falls ill, his wife and children surround his deathbed and cry. In the midst of his dramatic situation, the Li comes in and demands the family to stop with their crying because they are disturbing the process of transformation in which the Li is immersed. Once the two friends are left alone, the Li admits to accept his own death as simply one more in the natural course. He acknowledges the disintegration of his individual existence and his subsequent transformation into another entity. The similar standpoints held both by Zeyu and Ze Lai confirm the initial pact that standard that started their friendship. Both welcome death in the same natural way in which they accept life and its assimilation into the person is not interpreted as mere resignation, but rather as the fruit of open-minded acceptance and willingness to see life as an ongoing transformation. The Taoist concept of change appears in this way, as I think Hans Georg Modern uh, likes this distinction, as an ontology of process, right? Is it his? somebody's, uh, rather than an uh, ontology of substance. Accordingly, the essential feature of life, of the way, of the person, is the process as such. There are no substances in this ontology, there, and there is no self. Neither there is a logos that undergoes change. Nothing subsists, and there is no permanent type of being beyond existence. Then we also get a fantastic bonus. In this way, in a sense, death is overcome. Okay? So not only we overcome the self, life and death not only occur in one body, to one body, but life and death together form one body. Understanding this one body of life and death is key to understanding the selfless less, self, the selfless self, and its calmness in the face of death. When the life falls ill, he displays a calm attitude of acceptance or death and connects his death to the nature of the world. As he says to end, a child obeys his parents wherever they may send him, north, south, east, or west. Now yin and yang are much more to a man than his parents. If they send me to my death and I disobey them, that would make me a traitor. What fault would it be of theirs? A clump burdens me with a physical form, labors me with life, eases me with old age, and rests me with death. Hence, it is precisely because I regard my life as good, I regard my death as good. All at once, I fall asleep. With the start, I awaken. Thank you. Sorry if I...